Hey there. You're watching the Aussie Boom Guru, and today I've got a tutorial in Rhino Inside, which is sort of a follow-up from a tutorial I did in Dynamo for Revit on formwork. So if you saw my formwork tutorial, you might know that Dynamo does struggle a little bit with large geometry, especially when doing things like intersections. And often I like to use Rhino Inside to work around this. Um, so in the next two parts, so I'll do a two part series, one now and one later in the week. Uh, we're going to be using Rhino Inside to assess the uh, feasible formwork surface area per element in Revit. My original Dynamo workflow could only do totals and I had a lot of trouble with complex geometry. So I hope that you find this useful. Um, I'm gonna be using the Elephant package um, in this case, so you will need that. Um, but otherwise we're mostly just using nodes that come with Rhino Inside and Grasshopper. So let's jump in. Okay, um, so let's begin. So I've got a structural model here. This is actually the Autodesk sample structural project. Um, bit of a dodgy project, but what I've done is just taken out all the rebar elements and anything that's overly detailed. I've taken out the steel structure, um, and I'm just focusing in this case on walls, floors, structural columns, and structural beams. So in this case, I actually already have um, successfully pushed uh, my formwork through to the elements, but what I'm gonna do is just undo a couple of steps and go back to before the point where, where I had this set up. So I do have a project parameter in here, which I'm just gonna get rid of, and we're gonna add that in part two. Um, but at this point, my model is ready to be uh, moved over to Rhino so I can analyze the geometry. And this, this is just, just going to focus on the process of moving that geometry successfully. So we're going to want to move these elements over with uh, their element ID so that we can retrieve them later on in Rhino. We're going to move this into the object as what we call an attribute. So in this case, if I do select an element and go IDs of selection, each element in the model is going to have this unique element ID. And we're going to make sure that we capture that in the geometry that we put into Rhino. So to begin with, I'm just going to go to Rhino inside, boot up Rhino, and I'm going to make a new document. In this case, so you can do meters or millimeters. I usually try to work in the same units as the model you're dealing with. So in this case, we're in millimeters um, in a standard Rhino model. And I'm just going to delete all these default layers that come in. We're not going to use them. I'll keep default, just as it's good to have an empty layer in Rhino so you can turn everything off if you need to. And I'm just gonna type in Grasshopper, just to launch Grasshopper inside Rhino, inside Revit. Okay, so to begin with, um, I am just gonna go over to the Revit tab and I'm gonna go to categories. And in this case, I'm gonna wanna query uh, categories, I think. I might actually get document categories. So in this case, um, I think that's currently under, uh, They've moved a couple of nodes around in here, so I do have to sometimes find myself checking where nodes have moved to. In this case, we've got the query categories, which will get all the documents categories in a list. And what I'm going to want to do is move this into a unique input to Rhino inside called a value picker. I'm going to connect this up. And now we have a nice big list of all the categories in the document. So I'm going to want to isolate the categories that we're going to bring in. We don't want to bring everything into the model, obviously. Um, so first of all, I'm going to get floors. So I'm just going to scroll down to F and I'm just going to hold down control so I can select multiple elements. So we've got floors. We're going to want to also get structural columns. We're also going to want structural framing and we're going to want walls. Great. So now we have these four categories. Now at this point, I usually like to build in a string filter on the script so it doesn't run straight away because this is a fairly geometrically heavy task. Um, so usually what I recommend doing at this point is adding a stream filter, connecting this to stream one, which by default isn't sent through. And we're just gonna add in a false start toggle. Now, if you have an old version of Ladybug installed, you might even have a special type of toggle called the false start toggle, which will always be off by default. I really wish the Rhino team would get this into Grasshopper. It's such a useful node. What happens is when you reopen the script, it always sets itself to false, even if you close the script with this set to true. Amazing input, love it. Um, so in this case, I'm just gonna say true. And now we're gonna send through these categories, but when it's off, we don't see anything. Great. So what we're gonna do now is use this to build a filter to collect all the elements of those categories. So I'm gonna go filter. I'm gonna get a category filter. And then we're just going to use this to query elements. So under element, query elements, and we're just going to filter these. Now, by default, there's a limit applied uh, that suppresses it to a certain number, which is by default 100. But if you zoom in, you can actually just remove that limit under all cases. So now it always gets all the elements. So at this point, we have all, I think it's going to be about 556 elements in the model. Um, so really handy. Um, what I can do now is just um, flatten this output so that they're all sitting at the same level. 
um, because we ended up with essentially four categories that we were working across there. And the next thing we're gonna do is we could get their geometry first. But what I'm gonna do is get their element ID first just because it's a little bit easier. Doesn't use much memory. So I'm just gonna save the script as well. Let's call this um, demo one. Okay, so under element, um, we've, the, the method for actually getting parameters has changed recently in Rhino Inside. Someone did ask me this on the channel recently and I wasn't aware uh, this had happened, but now it's actually the get and the set parameter functions are combined in one node. I don't mind it, but it's a little bit confusing, um, especially because it's called element parameter. It's not really obvious that it's being used to set or get parameters. But if we click on this, we'll find that now this node looks a little bit different. So we have the element, the parameter name or names, and then we have this um, optional value to set, which can be removed. So if I remove this, it becomes a get parameter node in principle. If I go take element and I call on the property of ID, this should give me a list of element IDs that correspond to each element um, if I check their value. And sure enough, we now have that corresponding ID and we can use this to call on the element later on when we need to. Really helpful. We're gonna set this to the element that we bake into Rhino for analysis. Um, you, you don't have to bake everything into Rhino, but I find it's easier because then Rhino only has to think about the geometry. Um, so in this case, I'm also gonna get the element category because these are on different categories, remember? So I am gonna put them onto categories by layer. Now, in this case, I've just used the wrong input. There we go. Um, now, what I'm also going to do is use this to define a layer. So using the Elefront package, um, which E are we looking at? That E. We're going to, in this case, uh, define a layer. And we're just going to feed every single one of these in. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to take this input as the name. Um, and even though it's going to create 556 layer inputs, it's only going to create that layer the first time as an attribute in the Rhino model. So you don't have to worry about it making 556 layers. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is quite heavy. Um, in this case, we are going to be getting the geometry of the elements, noting that in your model, it might be quite a big model. Um, so do save before, save in Revit in case you crash um, and consider doing it in stages. So maybe filtering elements by level instead of getting them all at the same time. Anyway, in Revit, I'm gonna to go to element and I'm gonna get the elements geometry. I'm gonna take each element, and this step can take a little while because I'm getting 556 elements. But in Rhino, I should now be able to see all these elements. Now I recommend going to, to Revit as well, and just making sure that, that you're not drawing any preview geometry, and this will make everything a lot faster because then Revit doesn't have to show the preview geometry as well. I find usually in Rhino Inside, Revit is like the bottleneck um, of everything that happens. So usually you wanna do as much as possible in Rhino um, and as little as possible in Revit. Okay, so from here, we have the geometry. Now, not every single shape might have just one piece of geometry. Say you're doing something with doors or windows. Um, sometimes you might have things like lines in here as well. A great way to just get rid of the things that don't match a certain class, I find, is just to say brep. And if you have any non brep objects at this point, it's gonna give you a an error. It's gonna make you go red. And some of these things won't actually be things like breps. They might have lines and they're gonna become null at this point. What you can do is just connect this to a clean tree. And this input here is gonna get rid of anything that's null. Um, so you're gonna be left with the breps essentially. Um, if, it, if it had things that weren't breps, it might try to convert them. Um, and if successful, then you'll get breps there as well. From here, we're gonna want a union each of these lists of breps. Now at the moment, I think every single element is just one solid, um, but some of these might have multiple solids uh, depending on the type of object you're using. So what I like to do here is graft onto each of these sets uh, a, un a union function. So it's gonna join them all by sublist or by, by branch. So each shape will now be represented just by a combined set of breps. So we know that each element should ideally just have one shape that corresponds to the element itself. The next thing we're gonna do is define some attributes. And I might also just flatten this output as well. So now we just have a, a flat list. And I'm gonna define some attributes using Elefront. So I'm gonna take attributes, define object attributes. And first of all, I am in this case going to uh, flatten here, just because at the moment, I think this does come in, in a non-flattened format. I'll just double check. Oh no, looks okay. Okay, so I'm gonna take these as my name. And then I'm just gonna input their layer. So now it knows what name and what layer to give to this geometry when we bake it using Elefront. 
Finally, I can go in this case to uh, the bake tab and just get a bake objects node. So I'm going to take my geometry, each shape, and I should have one attribute per geometry, which I do. So that's my attribute to give to the geometry. And I like to usually give a bake name to this as well. Uh, maybe we'll just call this uh, formwork analysis. So if we need to rebake this, we can. And finally, I'll just create a bake button. So I'll get a button input. And I'll just rename this to bake. So when we run this, it should ideally just bake the geometry into the model, but also with properties. So if I bake, and I just minimize Grasshopper, I might even close Grasshopper so I don't see the preview, um, because at the moment the preview is sort of in the way. Great, there we go. If I go to shaded mode, Check it out, we have all our geometry, and if I turn off certain layers, notice that our columns are on one layer, our walls, our structural, structural framing, and our floors, so we can really easily isolate elements if we need to graphically, um, but we're also now ready to move on to our second part, which we'll do in a separate video where we actually analyze the formwork geometry and then send the analyzed area for each element back to Revit. So hopefully that was a helpful lesson on how you can get geometry into Rhino with data. I've done this workflow a few times on the channel before, um, but not typically in the context of structural elements. Um, in the next part, we're gonna have a look at how you can use this geometry and its data to assess the feasible formwork area per element. So we're gonna look for any, essentially any surface pointing lower than upwards um, associated to each element. Quite a complex workflow, um, but that's why I'm doing it in two parts. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so, and I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.